Today I want to talk to you about why rabies virus is not only the most fascinating virus in the world, but also the most diabolical. Did you know that since 1960, there have been roughly 125 cases of rabies in the United States in humans? It's not counting animal rabies. Of those 125 cases, about 30% of those have been due to dog rabies and canine rabies in general. But most of those cases are typically when humans from the United States travel abroad and bring back a strain of rabies that's more canine related. By the way, if you're ever traveling abroad, be careful how you interact with things you may do more regularly here like dogs and cats. The other 70% roughly in the United States cases of rabies come from bats. And out of those, about 70 cases are human deaths from bat rabies. So in general, rabies from bats dominate three to one in the United States and cause the most deaths. Why? Why does that occur? Most of us, when we were children, were taught to be wary of, you know, a rabid animal. Don't go around coyotes, don't go around feral cats, maybe stay away from those types of animals like a skunk or a raccoon. But most people find bats fascinating. They may even want to interact with bats. Uh, and many of the cases in human deaths, unfortunately, have occurred for that reason. When you look at a bat bite, the incisors of a bat's mouth are so fine. They're like, an in, like a needle, like a hypodermic needle. And they're so tiny that literally with a magnifying glass, a physician or others would have a very difficult time locating it. The bite might be uh, one of unknown exposure. Many cases are when an individual, typically children, unfortunately, stick their hands into a brush pile or around a tree where bats might roost, and they never even know they've been bit. Tiny bite marks, rarely does it bring blood. There's rarely any type of pain because it's such a fine needle-like tooth. So you can see some of the difficulties in even knowing you've been exposed. My name is Dr. Rodney Rohde. I am from Texas State University. And prior to my academic appointment as a Regents Professor and Chair of the Medical Laboratory Science Program, I spent a decade in the field at the Texas Department of Health in Austin and as a visiting scientist with CDC, working in the most fabulous area ever, which is zoonotic infections. Rabies dominated that work from diagnostics all the way to field work. So rabies virus is in the family Rhabdoviridae. It's within a genus called Lysavirus. Lys actually goes back to ancient times that kind of talks about, you know, the types of things you might see in a, in a rabid animal or, or a werewolf or things like that. So that's kind of where the name comes from. It is a deadly infection of the central nervous system. So many of you probably know that if you are bit by a rabid animal, whatever that is, if you're not getting vaccinated before symptoms start, it's roughly 100% fatal. I always like to tell the public it's 100% fatal. It's also 100% preventable with vaccination from that particular vaccine. So rabies is also an acute infection of kind of the CNS system. It causes acute encephalitis. Many people think of rabies as being foaming at the mouth, kind of aggressive behavior. That does happen. But really what happens with respect to it is the things you don't think about. Is a nocturnal animal like a, an, a raccoon or a skunk out during the daytime wanting to be pet, petted. So that's very unusual behavior. They, they should be more aggressive. So it's those kind of weird symptoms that can kind of show up. There's about 55,000 deaths from rabies if you look globally. In the United States, we don't really deal with that because we have laws for animal vaccination, livestock vac vaccination, great education. But in some places like Asia and Africa, it still dominates over almost 60,000 deaths a year. About one to three, one to two, one to three in the United States. We do have some years ahead of that, some below that. Uh, in 21, we had five uh, deaths from human rabies. Four of those were bat related. And it is an ancient disease, as I mentioned earlier. If you have an animal bite and you're suspicious of a rabies, one of the first things a physician will do is to kind of do a patient history, right? And so it, one of the difficult parts with bat rabies is the person may never know they've been exposed. So it's really critical if your child, especially a young child, tells you that, you know, mom, dad, there was a bat in my room last night, but they may say a bird. They may say something else has gone on. Tragically, many of the deaths in children, they've actually told their parents a story like that. And would you, what would you do? I would probably not really think about it unless you're hypersensitive like me. You may not even think of something like that. So it's really tragic when it comes to bat rabies. Other types of animals like dogs, 
you know, certainly a wild canine like a fox or a coyote, you would be having this this kind of conversation with the patient, even a dog. So even a dog bite. If you're bitten by a dog in the United States, you can actually quarantine the animal for about a week or so and watch the animal for signs. You can also choose to be vaccinated, which we'll talk about in a second. If it's livestock, other things like that, again, you may watch that animal. If the, if the person has proof of vaccination, they're going to dismiss it and you're okay because the animal's okay. If they can't show vaccination proof or if there's a reason to really be concerned, you're probably going to be moved to some type of vaccine series. If you look at wildlife rabies reservoirs in Texas, for example, where I am, and, and this really applies around the world and the country as well, the primary vectors or reservoirs for rabies are always going to be skunks and then bats. Those are the two biggest leading reservoirs in Texas right now. If you live on the East Coast, you might know it's raccoon rabies. If you live on the West Coast or in New Mexico, Arizona, you can have fox rabies. Alaska and Canada, you have Arctic fox types of rabies variants. So as many of us have learned over the last few years, rabies virus is rabies virus. It will kill you regardless of the variant, but there are reservoirs and variants that kind of fall into these different areas. And then bat rabies is if you think about it geographically uncontained, bats can fly, they can move. And so many times you'll see a bat rabies variant in a cat or in a cow or something like that that's bit an animal. Same thing with humans, you can have different variants. So one thing I wanna kind of leave you with today is bats are amazing, right? They are amazing creatures. They're warm blooded, they're, they're actually, fly, most of them fly and they do things like pollinate plants. They eliminate huge numbers of insects. They're even travel, tourism related. In Texas, if you've been there, you can go to Congress Bridge in Austin and watch millions of bat emerge from Congress Bridge. And it's a pretty fantastic event. The big issue with them, of course, is that you have so many types of issues around um, unknown exposures. In Texas, uh, everything's big. We also have the, the biggest number of bat species in Texas, around 30 plus species. There's roughly over 1,100 globally. Uh, one of the things I tell people when I took my first job at the Department of Health was I never thought I would become a bat speciation expert. I actually learned that on the job. It was really fascinating. It's more of a wildlife biology type of topic, as well as doing necropsy of animals to get to the brains for testing. They don't train you how to necropsy in, you know, in a dog head in, in school. It's more something you learn on the job. If you see um, some of the information around the bat cases in general, again, about 65 or more deaths due to bat rabies. It's almost three to one when you look at human deaths from bats. You can go to the literature. Many times these are leading headlines. You see some of these here from different places around the country. And again, unfortunately, it's almost always an unknown exposure. In some cases, tragically, people may actually know they've interacted with a bat, but they don't feel there's any danger. So it's the education piece, really tragic. And they often, you know, when they feel symptomatic, and they show up to their doctor, then they're talking about that because the physician's interviewing them and, and because of the acute encephalitis, they're gonna rule out other types of viruses and bacteria. And ultimately you have to get to that story about what were you doing a month ago when you were camping and you were interacting with a bat or, or what have you. Again, so many stories, if you look these up, typically of younger people that have tried to save bats. One of the most tragic cases I've seen was a teenager a young girl in a church who found a bat and actually told her mother, brought the bat to the mother and said, can I save it? And she's like, sure, you know, do what you, what you need to do. So she picked up the bat barehanded, carried it outside of the church and placed it in a tree, trying to be very helpful to wildlife and, you know, animal life. The bat nicked her. She even saw the blood, but they really didn't know to follow up. Just tragic cases like that. What happens when you know uh, you are either working with this type of virus or you actually might be bitten by an animal. There's actually things you can do. This is typically called post-exposure prophylaxis. You also have pre-exposure prophylaxis. So when I was working for the public health department and CDC, I would receive a pre-exposure vaccine and that kind of protected workers from possible unknown nicks or things like that. You cut yourself during necropsy or making a slide. I like to 
I like to tell my students I'm absolutely ready for the rabies zombie apocalypse because I've had numerous boosters of, of this vaccine and others. First thing that happens once you know you have an exposure and you're concerned and you're going to proceed with the vaccine, there it is not 20 to 30 shots in the abdomen. That's long ago. I still have people that tell me that's what happens and they're terrified. So we, we kind of work through that in a, in a communication way to educate people. It's actually more like a tetanus shot. It's in the, in the arm. You get it at zero, three, seven, and 14 days in that area. And right as you're doing the first uh, injection, you'll also get something called human arabes immune globulin. It's a passive immunization, so they give you a lot of little injections right around the site of the bite. And the idea is that you're tying up and neutralizing that virus so it can't spread into the neuronal system. So if you are immunocompromised in any way, you might get a fifth booster 28 days out. That saves your life. That is one, it's been 100% effective for decades. We've never had any vaccine failure in those areas. So if you look in the United States, again, just a reminder as we kind of wrap up this particular talk about the most diabolical virus in the world, rabies in my opinion, in the U.S., the biggest risk for the public are bats, downed bats, sick acting bats. Of course, any type of animal that, you know, you shouldn't be interacting with should be a concern, but bats are the primary vector of rabies. We tend to see other types of rabies in skunks. So that's primarily Texas. But as we talked about today, if you're interacting with any other type of wild animal, that's going to be a problem, not just from rabies, but from other types of species. So thank you so much and have a great conference here at ASM. And I look forward to meeting you if I have the chance.